In the last couple years, I've discovered a deep abiding love of dark academia. And last year I did a video where I read a few dark academia books, including the classic dark academia pick, The Secret History. I had such a great time with that video last year. And in general, I adore dark academia so much that as soon as September 1st hit, I decided I was going to do a part two to that video. So that is this video. I'm going to be reading four books that I have heard our dark academia and you know I'll judge them thoroughly whether I think they actually are dark academia and also whether I think they're any good. So the four books that I am planning on reading for this video are The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. This has a university for its setting and intertwines Greek mythology and obsession and murder. So sounds very up my alley and also perfectly dark academia. I also have the sequel to one of my earlier Dark Academia reads that I really enjoyed, The Atlas Six. So I have The Atlas Paradox by Olive e. Blake. This is book two in the series, and this is a fantasy bent of Dark Academia with morally gray characters in an academic setting with magic and lots of dark undertones. So I'm really excited to read book two and see where this story goes because I was really pleasantly surprised by the first book and ended up enjoying it much more than I thought I would. I read that book actually as part of a book talk books reading vlog. So I'll link that one if you want to see that. But I did not expect to enjoy it nearly as much as I did. So I'm excited to read book two. Then I have These Violent Delights by Micah Nemerever. This is one that I see constantly recommended in Dark Academia videos. This is another one that is in a university setting. This is in the 70s in Pittsburgh and features a gay relationship with very dark, cruel undertones. I've heard that this is really good and also very solidly in the dark academia genre. So I'm really excited to read this one. And I'm thinking this might be the first one I pick up because I'm very curious about it. And last but not least, a book that I've had sitting on my TBR pile for an embarrassing amount of time because I was intimidated by how big it was. <laughs> Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Miro. This is a book that takes place in Victorian London and features, I believe it's two children with mysterious powers who are being hunted by a figure of darkness. It sounds spooky and monstrous. Even though it's not in an academic setting, I feel like the Victorian London setting is going to give us those same sort of gothic vibes that dark academia tends to deliver on. It's been on my TBR for a long time. It's very long. And this is a reason for me to force myself to read it. So I'm going to. As always, I'm going to be doing updates as I read these books to give you my impressions. And for all of them, I'll be giving a final review and rating and whether or not I would recommend them. So settle in, get cozy, maybe grab some tea or hot chocolate or something and hang out with me while I read these four dark academia books. So I think I'm going to start with These Violent Delights. This is actually the newest to my collection, but it's really intriguing me. I just need to know what happens. <laughs> so I think I'm going to start with this one first and I'll be back once I've read a little bit to give you my thoughts. Let's go.
So I just finished part one of These Violent Delights, which means I'm approximately 25% through. I'm on page 130. And damn, there's a lot going on here. And I want to try to keep it spoiler free. So maybe what I'll do is a spoiler free section and then a little spoiler section for anyone who's read it. There's a lot more to this than I initially expected. I think I thought from the blurb on the back that this was going to be dark academia, obviously, but with, you know, a mysterious college student, Julian, who was sort of going to tempt our protagonist, Paul, to the dark side and things were going to get violent and intense. And that was kind of the crux of the conflict, I suppose, of the book. And then as I got a couple chapters in, it became very clear to me how much of this book is about grief and love and loss. And I've found those conversations really fascinating. I think that's what's engaging me most as I read this. I've written some really long notes in the book, ends of chapters where there's a blank page. I've written basically a whole page of my own notes um, with extra post-its about some of the concepts that are being brought up. This one in particular was specifically about a theory of love and sort of a metaphor for loss that ties into that theory of love. I found that really interesting. I'm really engaged by the conversation about what love is and what grief is and the messy, complicated experience of processing grief and loss. That's something that I have appreciated in other books that I've read, which I've talked about on this channel, and I didn't expect this book to go there. And I'm really enjoying that conversation. So that's a very pleasant surprise. The academia side is going well. There was definitely more of that academic setting and more of those sort of intellectual debates and discussions in earlier chapters. We've kind of moved away from that as we continue through. I'm not sure if we'll get back to that later or not, or if that's just sort of the setup to some of the concepts coming later, some foreshadowing. So we'll see. And the darkness is definitely there. I'm finding the two main characters, Paul and Julian, really fascinating and their dynamic is deeply complex. They're both traumatized in a variety of ways. They're both deeply flawed. They're very young and they both take their pain and anger and anguish out on each other in a variety of ways. They both are deeply insecure and vulnerable in different ways. So I'm finding that dynamic really interesting. I'm finding the sort of slow development of their relationship really interesting to read. It's super windy today, so I apologize. I'll try to cut out as much as I can in editing, but if you can hear the wind, sorry about that. My neighbor's grandkids are also jumping on a trampoline, so if you hear them, I apologize again. I think sort of where the cruel volatility, where that darkness is coming from in their relationship is coming in a way that I didn't expect from reading the blurb and also from the early portions of the book. As I continued on, I did start to sort of pick up on the fact that things were not quite as they seemed and that appears to have been confirmed by the final chapter at the end of part one. Of course, it's only part one. I'm only a quarter of the way through, so maybe that's a little bit of a red herring and things will change. The dynamic will change, but it's definitely shifted. And I think it's interesting. I'm still trying to keep this spoiler free, but I think it's interesting the way the book is framing their dynamic and where that darkness is coming from and sort of what its purpose is versus how I'm interpreting it as a reader. And that dichotomy is fascinating to me. And I'm wondering if it's an intentional thing, if it's something that's going to sort of pay off later in the novel and has to do more with sort of the unreliability of the narrator, or if it's something that has more to do with my interpretation of what's happening, not aligning with what the author is trying to put out there. So we'll see as the book continues. But all that to say, <laughs> I am really enjoying this. It's intense and I've cried a couple times already reading uh, portions about loss and grief. I'm finding it really quite fascinating and engaging and immersive. So I'm excited to keep reading this. I am a little disturbed by how part one ended. So we'll see how that continues. I imagine it will escalate from there. We have had the introduction of some pretty intense violence. So We'll see how that goes. Yeah, very intense. I'm, as always, going to compile a list of 
content trigger warnings that I notice as I'm reading that I'll share once I finish the book. And I would highly recommend if you're thinking about reading this, checking those out before you start. This takes place in the 70s and the main characters are in a gay relationship. So I will say right off the bat that the amount of homophobia that we've already seen is incredibly heartbreaking. It is really hard to read and there's not been something to the point of a hate crime or violence based on their sexuality, but so many small moments with Paul's family in particular that are just really hard to read. So definitely something to keep in mind there. But I think that's about all I can say spoiler free. So I'm going to move into a spoiler section to talk about the first quarter. And as always, I'll have a frame around me while I'm talking about spoilers. And I'll also have them linked in the chapters down below. So you can just skip to the end of the spoiler section if you don't want any of those. So spoilers about the first quarter, the way that the back of the book <laughs> frames the dynamic between Paul and Julian and then how the first chapters sort of start off very much frame Paul as the shy, quiet, introverted, lonely, sort of insecure character who is sort of taken under the wing of a popular, confident, you know, affluent boy at his college and becomes incredibly dependent on him. And the framing is that Julian sort of corrupts him to violence, that Julian is cruel and vicious. And Paul is sort of incapable of resisting his charismatic pull to the dark side, basically. But very shortly after a couple chapters, I started to feel that that was not exactly accurate. And I am wondering if that, like I said in the non-spoiler section, something to do with an unreliable narrator situation where we're in Paul's head and we only see Julian through his eyes and he sees himself as a victim of Julian even when he is the one causing the harm and committing violence. The final chapter at the end of part one involves Julian telling him to hit him and saying, I know you want to basically and do it. And Paul does it and beats him to a pulp and then frames it as Julian being the aggressor, basically, and Julian forcing him to do something he didn't want to do and him being at Julian's mercy and that Julian is cruel by how like calm and supportive he is after the fact. And I just found that pretty unsettling to read, but it also gave me that feeling, that sort of dichotomy between how the book is framing their dynamic and how I'm interpreting the dynamic, because as much as Julian might have invited it or told him to, Paul still decided to do it. You know, Paul didn't have to agree or go for it. That was completely his choice. And he also didn't stop when Julian started asking him to stop. So who is the violent one in that situation? Who is the one who needs to apologize? Who is the one introducing an incredible amount of cruelty and violence into their dynamic? It doesn't feel like Julian to me. And I do hope that as the book continues, it sort of pays off in that, that it becomes very clear that the author is also on the side of Paul being the one who is cruel and dark and violent and that his interpretation of the situation is not accurate because he's trying to protect his own psyche, basically. I would be disappointed in the book if it felt like it was condoning that interpretation of the situation because up to now, Julian has done basically nothing <laughs> at all that could be interpreted as cruel or vicious. So yeah, we'll see. Obviously, we're early on, so we'll see how that sort of plays out. But I was pretty shocked by the final chapter and just it's not very graphic, but just the extent of the violence is, um, yeah, I kind of expected it to happen, but I was still surprised and sort of taken aback by it. So yeah, that's a lot. I, I'm still processing because I just finished reading that passage and it's just, it was intense. So yeah, we'll see how that kind of progresses as the book continues. I am intrigued by their dynamic as much as it's unsettling to read. Paul's father completed suicide um, shortly before the beginning of the book, and that is causing a lot of heartache and grief, as you would expect, in Paul and his entire family. And just so many of those passages that are touching on grief and how different characters, different family members are processing and dealing with the grief and talking about love and connection and belonging are very poignant. I'm feeling very emotional as I read those passages. Like I said, I've cried a couple times. So I'm finding that discussion really emotionally engaging and beautiful in some ways while finding the 
character development of Julian and Paul and their relationship. Disturbing yet fascinating in more of a removed sort of intellectual academic way, I guess. So we'll see if those two pieces can sort of be married because as of right now, I don't feel emotionally connected to either Paul or Julian. They feel almost more like an idea, like a placeholder of a person, even though they are very complex and flawed and there is a lot of information there. I almost wonder if the sort of detached feeling that I have from the characters is coming from a place of Paul as the narrator and how Paul views the world and being a bit detached from the world around him and maybe not quite engaging with himself or others on that really deep human connection level that is causing that, um, which is an interesting choice by the author if it is an intentional choice. But I do typically prefer to feel emotionally invested in characters so we'll see how i continue to feel about the book as it progresses so that is it for my update for the first quarter the first part of these violent delights the next part is a bit shorter so i might read part two and part three before the next update and then finish the book and do a final update we'll see it's still up in the air but interesting so far i'm definitely intrigued so i will be back with more thoughts later on. Hello again. It's the next morning and I've been sitting in bed for a couple hours reading more of these violent delights. I'm not quite to the next section yet, so I need to read a little bit more before I do another update. But while I was sitting here reading, I just kept thinking how cozy I was and how much I love reading in bed, how comfy it is. And then it occurred to me that this was the perfect time to introduce you to this video's sponsor because they are a major component to my level of comfort while I'm sitting reading in bed and also while I'm sleeping. And that is... Marlo. I might have mentioned in previous videos, I'm pretty sure I have, that I am not a good sleeper. I have struggled with insomnia since I was a literal child and it really hasn't gotten significantly better <laughs> into my adulthood, though I have learned techniques and things that I can try that help with my ability to get a good night's sleep. And one thing I have learned to value so, so deeply is my bed situation. So mattress, sheets, and pillows. And the Marlowe pillow is the newest addition to my perfect little haven of a bed. And I am so, so glad that I gave it a try because both my husband and I are huge fans. Marlowe is a pillow brand committed to getting you a better night's sleep. I'm kind of like Goldilocks when it comes to pillows in that I am very picky and I want my pillow to be just right. I don't want good enough. I don't want kind of sort of maybe there. I want the perfect pillow. Most pillows I've used have either been too flat or too lofty, both of which hurt my neck, or either way too soft where they seem like they have a good loft to them and then you put your head on them and you just sink all the way through to the mattress, or way too firm where I get an earache in the middle of the night because it's like sleeping on a rock. But Marlo manages to walk the perfect line in between those things. First of all, it has adjustable loft, which is such a brilliant idea. And it means that there are these zippers on either side that you can zip closed or open depending on your preference. And that can make the pillow either a little bit flatter and firmer or a little bit loftier and softer. I personally prefer to open the zippers to get that little bit more loftiness and softness. It's basically like sleeping on a cloud. I get that coziness, soft sinking into the pillow without sinking all the way through because this pillow has really nice substantial fill. It's actually pretty heavy for a pillow. I feel like if I were to use it in a pillow fight, the other person would take heavy damage. <laughs> 
which is what I like in a pillow. Other adjustable pillows involve extra filling that you can either put in or take out, but that can be messy, a bit of a hassle, and you also have to have a place to store extra filling in case you need it. The Marlow pillow is so much easier to use, literally just unzip or zip, whatever the case may be, and you've adjusted your pillow. I also tend to be a hot sleeper, and if you have had that experience, you know that it is impossible to sleep when you are too hot. It is so uncomfortable. But Marlow has thought of everything, and they use extra chill cooling infused foam. Perfect for us hot sleepers. With Marlow, when you buy more, you save more. If you get two pillows, you get 20% off. Four pillows, you'll get 30% off. And with my link in the description box, you'll get an additional 10% off. So don't wait to get yourself a better night's sleep. Click the link below to get your very own Marlow pillow and change the way you sleep forever. If you're still on the fence, just know that Marlow offers a 365-day free return policy. Plus, they have a two-year warranty if you're not absolutely happy with your purchase. It's a risk-free way to get a better sleep. So click the link below and check out Marlo. Thank you again to Marlo for sponsoring this video and for making it so ridiculously cozy to sleep in my bed, but also to sit in my bed all day and read. It's my favorite way to spend a day, so. So I was going to come back somewhere in the middle of this to give another update before I got to the end, but I kind of got carried away and I wanted to know what happened. So I kept reading and I finished the whole thing, but I have thoughts. So let me share them. Starting with my non-spoilery thoughts. What can I say <laughs> that doesn't give things away? First of all, I think this book has a lot to give. It's a very complex book. It is exploring a number of different issues, and I found that exploration fascinating. We have our protagonist, the character whose head we're in, who is Paul, and then we also have his love interest and really only friend, Julian, and they're both students at a university in the 70s dealing with homophobia and each dealing with their own trauma, specifically from their parents. So when it comes to the themes and the characters, this book really delivered, in my opinion, as a character-driven reader and a thought-driven reader, where I'm, you know, really drawn to the specific themes within a book that I'm reading. This book really catered to my interests, as well as having a very atmospheric feeling and having purple prose, which sometimes gets on my nerves, but 99% of the time I'm going to eat it up. I love beautiful language. <laughs> so purple prose is not a drawback for me. Starting off with the themes, the author mentions in the author's note, with the skeleton of the plot squared away, I was free to write about queer alienation, the provisional whiteness of Jews in America, the lonely arrogance of clever young adults. So that's sort of where the jumping off point of this is. And he also mentions in the author's note that he was growing up in a post-Columbine America, living essentially in constant fear of his own adolescent anger. And that that fear that something could set off a violent tendency, that his own loneliness and isolation, his being on the receiving end of anti-Semitism, and homophobia could lead to him lashing out in a violent way is something that he grew up feeling afraid of and in that way grew up being afraid of himself or a part of himself. I think all of these themes are obviously valid and worthy of being explored. And I really appreciated the way that they were explored in this novel, especially because they were all coming from a very personal 
place for the author. I could really feel that while reading that this was something the author could relate to. And in my experience, that always drives home with the thematic content to a whole other level. I should also add in terms of thematic content that this book has a lot to do with grief and loss and processing of trauma. Both Paul and Julian are very sad boys. Um, I say boys because they're 17, 18, and they're certainly very young still. But they both have a lot of sadness, they both have a lot of grief and loss in their lives already, and that really permeates the pages of this book. It's on every page, it's in every word, it's in every interaction they have. And that's something that I didn't expect going into it, and something that I found deeply poignant and really beautifully expressed. Thematically, this book gets a thumbs up. I was a fan, I found the conversations that were happening, even conversations that were getting into the morality of scientific experimentation. There's a lot packed into this book, but I think it was handled really well. So moving on to the language, like I said, this book is full of purple prose and I'm a fan of purple prose, so that was fine with me. If you're not a fan of flowery language, language that could be categorized as pretentious, <laughs> you might not enjoy this, but I personally love pretentious <laughs> language. What does that say about me? I don't know, but I love it. So I was a big fan. I had two separate tabs for the writing, one specifically for quotes that even out of context, I felt had something of value to portray and were beautiful, but also for just areas of really nice language, whether it was describing something or just a little turn of phrase that made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside because I thought it was beautiful that I also had a tab color for. I could give a plethora of examples, but let me just turn to a random one and see what comes up. It was a handsome silk lining for the inside of the shadow box they would trap each other in, and both of them knew it. But Paul could tell from his smile that Julian almost didn't mind. The footpath was carpeted now with dead leaves and frost, but he remembered the woods chattering with birdsong, path fringed with bright ferns, wildflowers alongside the creek like smears of blue pastel. If they paid him any attention now, he no longer noticed. He imagined that in Julian's presence they had gone sunblind, and that they would only perceive Paul himself as a faint blur at the periphery. I won't spend ages reading off quotes I enjoyed, but suffice to say, there are many. I really enjoyed the writing here. And leading off the writing style or the language itself, we get into the setting or the atmosphere. This book definitely has, I would say, the atmosphere of dark academia. It has that sort of melancholic, mysterious, almost oppressive at times, and also very sort of intellectual and ruminating energy. The setting itself is only partially academic. I would have loved if more of this book took place on campus and we had more descriptions of the university itself. The academic setting is definitely not as all-encompassing as some other books that fit within this genre, but I would say that the themes, the sort of oppressive dark atmosphere, the characters themselves, there is a very dark academia feeling to all of those aspects of the story. And I do think it fits sufficiently into the category of dark academia that I would keep describing it that way. So speaking of the characters, I want to move on to them because that's definitely where I have the most thoughts. This book is a collection of events happening from Paul's perspective, who is a 17-year-old boy. He has recently lost his father in a really tragic way. He is not processing his grief well. And on top of that, he already was very stuck in his head, a very quiet, introspective, ruminating sort of tendency toward depression and anxiety, lonely boy, and also a certain level of self-hatred. His self-esteem is very low. He really struggles to find his own worthiness and to view himself as deserving and worthy of love and care. Paul as a character is really complicated in general, but also specifically, I guess, for me reading it, because there are a lot of aspects of Paul specifically at the beginning of the novel, that I could relate to when I was his age. Those sort of transitional years from high school into college and then post-college life and adulthood, I was in a very similar place of being very quiet and introspective, you know, just on a similar wavelength in terms of being prone to anxiety and depression and being a bit of a melancholic person and really struggling with self-esteem and self-love. Reading this book from Paul's perspective, being in his head, seeing the things he says and the ways he was 
repeating these really harmful patterns and self-destructing and self-sabotaging just over and over and over again. Ad nauseum was painful to read and it was really vacillating between the extremes of resonating with him very deeply and feeling a lot of sympathy and empathy for him, wanting him to grow and evolve in the ways that I have managed to over the past decade with a lot of therapy and loving healthy relationships and being, you know, disappointed by the fact that it's not happening for him the way I hoped it would. But I also went to the other extreme of kind of hating him <laughs> because it can be really hard and uncomfortable to read a character that reminds you of all the worst parts of yourself. Those self-destructive and victim mentality and punishing yourself and the people around you for daring to try to care for you and not believing them when they say they do and pushing them away. But I will say that the violent tendencies that are shown by Paul are not things that I can relate to. I never felt my extreme, you know, sadness express itself in a violent or angry way. I do think some of that might be a socialization thing where men are conditioned by society to think that the only valid emotions for them to feel are happiness and anger. And anger is really the only way that they can be expressive in their emotions and get those difficult feelings out and be accepted as still being manly and fitting within the norms of their gender. Whereas women have a lot more leeway to be sad and to express their sadness and despair. So I think possibly for that reason, and also just the fact that I'm not a violent person <laughs> in terms of his struggles with his mental health and his lack of self-esteem, I can relate very deeply. And that was both a blessing and a curse when it came to this book, because it definitely drew me in. It definitely felt incredibly grounded and real. I could tell the author had felt all those same feelings and I felt a kinship with the author through the character of Paul, but it was also really hard to read because it is, you know, hard to look in a mirror at the worst version of yourself. And I can luckily look in that mirror knowing that I have grown and changed a huge amount since then. And I am not that same person that I was, but it's still hard to be faced with that, I think. So that's kind of how I felt about Paul. <laughs> As the book progressed and we got sort of deeper into this toxic sort of repetitive dynamic between him and Julian, and then also the increasing anger and violence, I found it harder and harder to relate to Paul. And I started to get a little bit exasperated <laughs> with Paul as a character, both in terms of obviously not agreeing with violence as a way to process the feelings he was going through and condemning him from a moral or ethical standpoint for his actions, but also just things started to get really repetitive in terms of his self-hatred, his self-victimization, his constant pushing everyone away and talking about what he deserved or didn't deserve, the self-loathing, the vindictiveness. It all started to get to be a bit much. And I did find that, you know, if I were to critique something in terms of the actual writing of the novel or the structure of the novel, is that I think this book would have been well served to be a little shorter. We come in at about 450 pages, and I would say a good 100 pages of this novel were just repeating the same conversations between Paul and Julian over and over and over again. And at a certain point, it just became a little tedious. I do think some repetition makes sense to really get across the sort of obsessive, cyclical, toxic nature of their dynamic and both of them being traumatized and just not being able to escape this loop of coming together and seeking support and love and care and then pushing each other away and being vindictive and angry and fighting. And, and I think some of that really shows what their dynamic is like and drives it home, but too much, you know, there, it's a fine line between enough to show that cyclical nature and the repetitiveness of it and how tiresome it is even for them to, you know, tipping the needle too far into just repetitive and tedious for the reader territory. And I do think, unfortunately, it did go a little too far. And that was really around the time that I stopped having really any sympathy for Paul as a character, because while I know realistically the time frame of this book is not nearly enough time for someone like Paul to work through his issues and to grow 
as a person. It certainly took me a lot longer than the time frame of this book to heal and grow from where I was at at that age. And I wasn't dealing with quite as severe a situation as Paul is, and I had a lot more support. But it is fiction, and I think it's fair to ask a fiction to either be a little bit more concise if it's going to, you know, sort of subject the reader to a character that isn't going to grow and change over the course of a novel, or that it does deliver a certain amount of growth and change, even if it happens a little faster than it would in real life. I think that's about all I can say about Paul without spoilers. So I'll move on to Julian briefly. I do have less to say about Julian because he wasn't our point of view character. I did find Julian really interesting and I would have loved to get more of who he really was. And this is another area where I started to get a little frustrated with Paul as a character because I wanted to learn who Julian was in his own right. And it became very clear earlier on and then just more and more blatantly clear as the book continued that we really didn't know anything about Julian at all because everything we learned about him was through this heavily filtered, heavily biased and skewed lens. And Paul is not necessarily a reliable narrator. So I was intrigued by Julian. I wanted to learn more about him. The little snippets we got revealing his motives or his true feelings, I found quite touching. And I always wanted more. <laughs> if I could turn this book into anything, if I could make any changes I wanted, I would have had at least one chapter from Julian's point of view, maybe even the final chapter. And it doesn't have to be sort of a tell all where he goes through his feelings at every stage, but even just one moment of his thoughts and feelings told from his own point of view without that lens. So we have a little snippet of truth of who Julian was. I also had sort of a theory about Julian that didn't end up coming to fruition that I thought would be really cool and I was kind of disappointed it didn't go that way. I might keep the spoiler section in case someone else reading it also has that theory. I don't want to have already told you that it's not real because that feels like I'm spoiling it a little bit too. So I'll talk about that in the spoiler section. And that is kind of it. I guess the last thing would just be their relationship in terms of them being a romantic relationship in a gay relationship in the 70s and sort of semi out to their families. I found that aspect of the novel beautiful, but also deeply, deeply sad, just heartbreaking to read how their families reacted to their relationship, especially Paul's family. They love him, but they can't accept his sexuality and his relationship. And it's just really, really painful to read and likely very accurate to the 70s, possibly even more accepting than a lot of families would have been at the time. But damn, it just... <laughs> It really was devastating to read a lot of those passages. I found their relationship really troubling in a lot of ways because of how hurt they both were and how little they were able to open up to each other and be vulnerable and communicate and support each other in the ways that they each needed. I don't think they were good for each other. <laughs> it's a very toxic dynamic and a harmful dynamic for both of them. But there were so many moments that were just absolutely gorgeous. You know, not only the way they were written and described, but just the pure love and emotion and belonging and care. Those little moments where you could sort of see the potential of who they could have been together if they both had extensive therapy. <laughs> so once again, I will put this frame up while I'm talking about spoilers and the chapters down below will also have a timestamp so you can just skip to the end of the section. I'm gonna try to not rehash the things that I said in the non-spoilery section. I think a lot of those things sort of build up to the spoilery points I have. I think I'll start with my theory about Julian just because it's fresh in my mind. I was convinced. <laughs> from at least the halfway point that Julian was not real and he was a figment of Paul's imagination, disassociating and hallucinating this other person who was all the things that he wanted to be and using that as a way to cope with his grief and sadness and anger and self-loathing and just personifying everything that he hated about himself and everything he wanted to be into Julian. That didn't turn out to be the case. It turned out that Julian was real, which is fine, <laughs> but... I really got attached to that theory. I was convinced and I thought it was going to be a really interesting twist and I was looking forward to seeing how the author was going to make it happen, but I was kind of hoping that that was where it was going because I thought that was an interesting take on their dynamic and this idea that we only ever saw Julian through his eyes because he didn't really exist except for through 
Paul's eyes. I think that is somewhat true in that the version of Julian we got in this book only existed through Paul's eyes. Who Julian really was, was not the person that we got because Paul's perspective is skewed. You know, in some ways, I think that still fits with my theory where the version of Julian that Paul is in love with and the way that he interprets every single thing Julian says and does is so skewed that the version of Julian that he loves is not a real person. So I thought that would be really interesting. But alas, it was not to be. From an, very early in the novel, I think I even mentioned this in my first update, I was already starting to feel like Julian was not this villain that he was being portrayed as, both by the sort of blurb on the back of the book, but also by Paul's inner monologue. I think I was proven right by the novel that, you know, so many of the things that, so many of the cruelties that Julian showed were really just Paul interpreting things he said and did as the cruelest possible interpretation. Even things like Julian asking if Paul was okay were interpreted as, you know, Julian purposefully being this Machiavellian, manipulative, evil mastermind who knew how to poke at Julian's soft spots and really hurt him while he was down. When it's like, he literally just asked if you're okay. You look a little sad. He asked if you're okay. That's like a normal thing for a partner to do. So I was very much on Team Julian from very early on. And as the book progressed, it just grew bigger and bigger. I think he was very hurt and sad. And you know, this persona that he built for himself was this armor that he was wearing to protect himself from more hurt and loss and rejection and pain. And Paul interpreted it as, you know, the real him and that he was this strong, confident, can't do wrong, smart, funny, charismatic person. And that was who Julian wanted to be and who he wanted other people to see him as, but that's not who he was inside. And he and Paul had so many more similarities when he got deep down to the core of them than Paul would have ever been open to or acknowledged. I would honestly love if the author would rewrite this book from Julian's perspective. I think that would be fascinating and I would read it in a heartbeat. But yeah, I, I definitely found the path they went down and the violence pretty darn disturbing and, you know, hypocritical on every level. And then I found the ending. I don't know how I feel about the ending. So basically, if you haven't read this book, but you're watching the spoiler section because you have no interest or you, the, you know, you know that the content is not going to be for you or whatever. Basically, at the end, they've murdered a man who served in Vietnam and they decided from their research that he deserved to die as an example to other people who follow orders indiscriminately and harm innocent people. So they decided to murder this man and they murder him and their plan doesn't quite go the way they wanted and they end up getting caught. It turns out that the police don't have enough hard evidence to convict them, but they know it was them and they have a lot of circumstantial evidence and Paul ends up being basically put on house arrest by his family and not allowed to leave or see Julian. And they're both really struggling with being apart and they want to have their life together. They want to escape together and they're sort of trying to plan it even though they can't be in contact. And at the end of the novel, they are escaping together. They're on their way and Paul wants to pull off at this wooded area and they're going through the forest. And then eventually Paul, you know, they get to the area where the ravine is and we get this reveal that Paul's intention is to commit murder-suicide. I think initially he wanted Julian to agree and for them to like hold hands and jump off into this drop and die on the rocks slash by drowning in the ravine together. But then Julian runs because he doesn't want to die and he is intent on strangling him until he dies and then throwing him into the ravine and throwing himself in afterwards. And he keeps talking about how this is a mercy and he wants them to be together forever. And it's the only way for them to be together forever. And eventually he lets Julian go. And we don't know what happened to Julian. We know that he went back to his apartment at some point because he left a note for Paul, but that's it. And it seems to be implied that Paul is going to be put in some sort of an inpatient program for his mental health. So that's the ending. <laughs> And I honestly don't know how to feel about the ending. On the one hand, it's tragic and open-ended and, you know, sort of lacking the catharsis <laughs> that you've been building up to in a way that feels discordant and painful and apt for this story. It certainly feels more realistic that we don't really know what's going to happen to them. and. 
It's not a happy ending. It's not all tied up with a bow. I expected Paul and Julian to forge a suicide pact. It felt like it was coming by the dialogue and their dynamic. So I kind of saw something along those lines coming. I did not see Paul just deciding unilaterally that it would be better for them if they were both dead and then trying to make it happen, even when it became very clear that Julian was not interested in dying. That was a lot <laughs> and certainly shifted my perspective of Paul even further. He's a very dangerous person and requires a huge amount of therapy and also probably to be incarcerated for a certain amount of time until he has had a sufficient amount of therapy to curb some of these impulses and to deal with some of this, you know, huge amount of despair and anger. Um, but wow, yeah, just a lot. And not only was Julian real, which I was very disappointed about, but the ending was so sudden and harsh and violent. We think they're about to have a happy ending and escape together, or at least some version of a happy ending. I mean, how happy are they going to be when they're both miserable separately and together, but at least, you know, a chance at a life together, which do they deserve that after what they did? No, but you know, I can root for them on a certain level as the main characters in the novel and also as very young troubled people, I guess. Yeah, it just, it sort of, turned suddenly and was shocking and upsetting and very visceral some of the descriptions um, of the attempted murder and then just so heartbreaking and devastating and it's just like it's over now nothing is good no one is happy everything is much worse than it was when this book started for everyone involved and that's it there's no hope not that I expected this book to have a happy ending necessarily but it's just I feel a little bereft <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but I think that's all I want to say in terms of spoilers. I don't want to rehash things I already talked about in the non-spoiler section. So final thoughts. Would I consider this dark academia? Yes, with the caveat that the setting is only in academia for the first portion of the book, but I do think the atmosphere and the writing style and the vibes sort of lend themselves to dark academia throughout. Would I recommend it? Yes. I think people who like dark academia, especially something like The Secret History, I think this is very similar to The Secret History in a lot of ways, not in a derivative way, but just that they share a lot of qualities. I would definitely recommend it to people who enjoy books like The Secret History. My final thoughts personally, <laughs> as a reader, just generally was very engaged with this and it's very much up my alley in terms of books that I would enjoy even despite some of the more difficult content to face. It was definitely uh, shocking and heartbreaking and repulsive at times uh, when it comes to especially the violence and as I talked about in the spoilery section, I'm on the fence about the ending. I'm not fully satisfied with it. And I don't know if that's just because that's the type of ending it is and it's meant to not be satisfying and to feel open-ended and discordant and unsettling. I think it was meant to be that, but I don't know if I like that or not, even knowing that that was likely the intention and it does seem to fit the book. I just don't know if I like it. So a bit on the fence there. I think I'm sitting around four stars. I might change my mind. I'm debating with myself because there is a lot here that is really well done. Maybe I'm at four and a half stars and I'll decide if I'm going to round it up or down once I've had a minute to process. By the time I'm editing this video, I hopefully will have processed it more and I'll put my final rating up on the book card right now, along with the trigger content warnings. Those are my thoughts on these violent delights. I had many of them, clearly, because I've talked for over an hour. So future me will have fun editing this down into something a little bit more concise. But that is the first book for this video. I think it was a success. So for my next book, I've decided I'm going to pick up The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. I'm hoping I can kind of zip through this one pretty quickly and uh, get some momentum going for this video. So I'm going to start reading this right away and I will be back for an update. I'll probably try to do a halfway point update and then an update at the end since this one's a lot shorter and we'll see what I think.
So I was going to come back and do an update halfway through The Maidens, but I read the whole book <laughs> last night and this morning. So this is going to be the only update for The Maidens because it is now finished. Part of the reason for that is that I had an audio influencer copy from Libro FM, which I listened to in conjunction with the book at the beginning, and then eventually pretty much solely listened to the audiobook, occasionally grabbing the book if there was something I wanted to mark, which this might look like a lot of tabs for some people, but it's very minimal annotation and tabbing for me. There wasn't a lot that I felt the need to mark. Speaking of Libro FM, because this was a Libro FM influencer copy, so I got it for free, I did want to mention that Libro FM is a really awesome way to get your audiobooks. They allow you to support local indie bookshops with your audiobook purchases, so I chose to support a little bookshop in Edmonton. And I really love Libro FM as a service in general. I would highly recommend it. Check them out if you want to support small indie bookshops, even as you listen to audiobooks. But I knew that I was going to at least try the audiobook, which I tend to do. I do prefer typically to do a sort of mixed media reading where I listen and read a physical copy at the same time. That's my absolute favorite way <laughs> to read books. But like I mentioned, I did very quickly shift from um, a sort of simultaneous read to pretty much solely the audiobook. And I think as far as this book is concerned, audiobook is the way to go. Personally, I found reading the physical book just made some of my pet peeves, some of the things I didn't love about the writing, far more obvious. Whereas in the audiobook, especially sped up to two and a half to three times speed, it was a lot easier to kind of overlook the flaws in the writing. So that might give you a bit of an indication on this one. I think I'll also do a spoiler section for this one because I have a bit of, I don't know if it's a rant exactly. I'm not sure I have enough strong feelings about it to rant about it, but I have some thoughts about the final twist that I want to talk about. So I'll do that in the spoiler section. But in terms of this being a dark academia book, I guess it is if you define dark academia as a book with dark themes that takes place in an academic setting or has academic themes, because this certainly does a thriller and there's murder involved. So within that definition, sure, it's dark academia. I just don't think it really had the vibes of dark academia or the atmosphere. And I think that's all down to the writing style. The writing was very simplistic, very minimal, pared back, blunt, sort of matter of fact in a way that kind of drained any of the possible vibes or atmosphere out of everything, even describing, you know, parts of the Cambridge campus that should be ripe for the taking in terms of a dark academia sort of spooky, creepy setting. Everything was just described as plainly and simply and quickly as possible. And I just didn't feel like I was there, which was a big disappointment considering the setting. I think it really had so much potential in that area, especially with this plot, this concept. There could have been so much more and it just really fell flat, which was unfortunate. It occurs to me that I read The Silent Patient years ago now, and it was one of the sort of earlier books that I read as I was getting back into reading after a long hiatus. And one of the first thrillers I read, because before my hiatus through sort of my early mid-20s, I didn't read any thrillers or horror or mystery really at all. And I'm starting to think that my enjoyment of that book is heavily reliant on the fact that it was one of the first, if not the very first thriller that I have ever read. Because the more I read in thriller, horror, mystery sort of genres, the higher my expectations get in terms of what I'm looking for. And I'm definitely thinking if I reread The Silent Patient now, my feelings would be very different. I think the author wanted, especially because of the subject matter and how much was sort of included of Greek tragedy, especially, to have this very academic, very sort of philosophical, poetic tone to both the book and to the various characters and how they spoke. But because the writing style was so pared back, so simple and matter of fact, the moments where characters did speak with a little bit more flowery language or things got a little more pretentious, which for me is not always a bad thing. It definitely stood out in a not so great way because it felt jarring and out of place. Comparing it directly to These Violent Delights, which I obviously just finished, in that book everyone is pretentious and the writing is pretentious, but it works because everything is pretentious <laughs> and all of the writing is pretentious. Every character is. That's how it's written. That's the language and that's the world of that book and it works perfectly in my opinion. In this book the pretension doesn't land. Last thing about 
the writing, the chapters are super short, ridiculously short. I'm I'm thinking the longest chapter might be four pages long. And this is maybe a personal pet peeve. Let me know in the comments if you have preferences as to chapter length. But this book made me realize how much I hate super short chapters where every single one ends with some sort of a dramatic statement or a twist or our main character, Mariana, having some sort of a revelation. It just felt very repetitive and tedious. And I found every time I was sort of starting to get into the flow of a scene, it was immediately over and the chapter was done and we were on to something else. And it just felt very choppy. I think the writing in general felt choppy, but the structure with the super short chapters definitely contributed to that feeling. Funnily enough, the writing is super simple. It's, I think it's meant to be read very quickly, sort of designed that way. And the chapters are super short, which also sort of leads you to just read another chapter because they are so short that you're like, well, maybe I'll just read one more. But the story itself is very slow paced. Nothing happens for a very long time. We sort of go in circles and things are revealed very slowly. So slowly, in fact, that the reader has time to figure out everything far before it is revealed to the main character or before she figures it out, which is a little frustrating to read because it's like the book is lagging behind the reader. Again, maybe it's just that I've read so much in the thriller genre at this point, and I'm not even, I wouldn't say, a prolific reader of thrillers, but I've definitely read significantly more in the last couple of years than I ever did before. Maybe it's just because of that that I see sort of the twists coming and, and can sort of sense when something's red herring. But I feel like even someone who's not super familiar with thrillers would see a lot of what was happening coming. I think it was pretty clearly telegraphed and the red herrings were very obviously red herrings. The characters in this book were very one-dimensional. Even our protagonist, we just don't get much of an insight into who they are or what they value or what makes them tick. And the villain has a classic, you know, villain monologue at the end where they explain why they did everything. I didn't feel any particular way about the reveal of who the villain was because the villain didn't feel like a real person and neither did anyone else, you know? I'm just checking my notes here to see if I missed anything. Characters are bland, atmosphere is basically non-existent, writing is clunky, simple and straightforward, yet trying too hard to be dramatic and self-important, pretentious in an insincere and cringy way, super short chapters are annoying, hate the villain, point of views, truly so badly written and pompous. Oh yeah, put a pin in that. <laughs> I need to talk about that. Uh, the writing isn't evocative at all. It doesn't draw you in or paint a picture. The pretentious flowery lines stand out as out of place and awkward because they're in a sea of blunt, simplistic writing. And then I start talking about some of my theories, which I don't want to give away. But basically the last thing I want to mention in the non-spoilery section, I think, is the villain point of view chapters. Every couple chapters, maybe every four or five chapters, we would get a chapter from the villain's point of view, which had a different narrator in the audiobook and was written in a different font in the book to make it obvious it was from a different point of view. I hated those chapters. <laughs> I wasn't a huge fan of Mariana and her chapters, but the villain point of view chapters were deeply cringy. Very dramatic and over the top writing, very pompous and pretentious, but not in a, not in the way I like. They were a big part of building up those red herrings, but I didn't enjoy them. And I don't think they really added anything other than making it very obvious that the characters they were hinting at were red herrings for various reasons. So yeah, that's my thought on this book. I don't know what to say. Mariana as a main character, she's apparently a therapist. She's very bad at her job and also doesn't seem particularly intelligent, despite the fact that she studied at Cambridge and is sort of telegraphed as intelligent. She is very unobservant about the people around her. And it's very ironic that she talks multiple times about how deeply she feels other people's emotions and, you know, how good she is at reading people and how great her instincts are about people because she's a therapist. And yet she really is awful at reading the people around her or knowing what they're thinking or knowing what kind of people they are at all. She's completely clueless. It's very annoying. I didn't enjoy the callbacks to The Silent Patient. There's a character in The Silent Patient who shows up again in this book and then the same psychiatric hospital that's in that book is also in this book. It just felt unnecessary. It was like, haha, see what I did there? It's all connected. Maybe just because I wasn't enjoying the book in general. It didn't really work for me. I just thought it was kind of silly. So yeah, I think those are all my non-spoilery thoughts. I'm going to transition into spoilery thoughts. So if you're never going to read this and you want to know the ending, or if you've read this, the ending is that Mariana's niece, Zoe, is the killer. And she was having an affair or being groomed more accurately by Mariana's husband husband while he was still alive, according to Zoe. The first time that she was assaulted by her uncle, um, but really basically 
stand-in father because of their situation was when she was 15. And according to her in her villain monologue, Sebastian never really loved Mariana. He married her for her money and because he wanted to get closer to Zoe and was immediately attracted to her when he met her for the first time when she was like six, which is disturbing on every level. And then came up with a plan once he and Zoe consummated their relationship that he needed to be with her and he couldn't wait any longer so he murdered Mariana's father who was a wealthy business person knowing that he would leave all of his money to Mariana and then he had this convoluted plan where he and Zoe would work together to murder a bunch of other people as a red herring or distraction so that they could also murder Mariana so that he could get all of her money and run away with Zoe but then they went on a trip a year before this book takes place because they were told they needed to relax by their doctor so that they could conceive and have a child. Not sure why Sebastian was pushing for them having a child. If he wanted to leave her and be with Zoe, that is never explained. But they go away on a trip to relax and then uh, Sebastian mysteriously decides to go swimming when the weather isn't great and drowns. He'd already expressed his whole plan to Zoe in person and also written her a bunch of letters talking about his troubled childhood. And she decided that the only way to avenge his death, because she blamed Mariana for his death, because he never would have gone to the island if not for her, that she would carry out his plan and murder a bunch of her classmates and pin it on a teacher so she could also murder Mariana and get her out of the way. Yeah, that is pretty ridiculous on many levels. And I think the most ridiculous thing is just that Mariana, as a self-identified empath and a therapist, didn't ever register that her husband not only apparently never loved her, but also was grooming her young niece that they had basically adopted and was planning on murdering her. So, yeah, that just feels a little unbelievable. I mean, she's a therapist. <laughs> And she won't stop talking about how good she is at reading people. Although we did learn throughout the course of the book that she's really not good at reading people. Maybe she's just not a good therapist. And of course, Zoe's villain monologue where she explains everything in detail was a little trite and silly. The red herrings in this book <laughs> were pretty funny to me, honestly. Every male character in the book had a similar enough backstory and it was revealed to us enough that we could think any of them could be this mysterious letter writer. Like every single one had a mother who died when they were young and had a father around, but they weren't really around. They were basically an orphan because their father was abusive and they all grew up on a farm so that they could fit within this farm backstory. And it just started to get a bit ridiculous that every single character, Sebastian, Fred, Henry, and Edward all had basically the same backstory just so that we could be really confused <laughs> by who it could be. Like I said in the non-spoilery section, I definitely saw a lot of it coming. I knew immediately that Edward Fosca was not the murderer because it says right at the start that she knows he's the murderer, so it's obvious that he's not. I was suspicious of Zoe from the very beginning, but it wasn't until maybe halfway through that I decided she definitely was in on it. I dismissed Henry earlier on because, again, it just felt too obvious that her one patient who was stalking her, essentially, and obsessed with her would be the murderer. I went back and forth in the second half between Fred and Sebastian. My theory with Sebastian was that he wasn't actually dead. I wasn't exactly sure how that would make sense. <laughs> because Mariana saw his body. I did not suspect that he and Zoe were having a romantic relationship. I thought maybe they just had a father-daughter sort of relationship and were doing it together for some reason. But I was also wondering if it could be Fred. And again, it's written in such a way that any of the male characters could have been the perpetrator. So it could have been. It turned out that it wasn't. And I'm kind of glad about that. The random sort of forced romance <laughs> between Mariana and Fred was maybe the only thing that I enjoyed about this book because Fred seemed kind of cute. He was a little forceful, a little bit of a nice guy with just continuing to push himself on her. But, you know, there were times when I felt like their dynamic was just kind of sweet and silly and he was super clumsy and kept just like knocking things over and spilling things on himself. I guess I can relate to that because I'm a very clumsy person. I don't know. Um, so even though I don't really care about Mariana that much, I guess I hope that she and Fred have a happy ending because and Fred almost died saving her life so since she seems to actually be into him maybe they should give it a go but anyway I think that's it for spoilers I feel like I don't have enough energy to rant about it because I just feel very meh about the whole experience so that brings me to my final thoughts on this book would I recommend it um 
Sure, if you're looking for a really easy thriller to zip through like in an afternoon or an evening, especially if you're an audiobook fan and, you know, if you can get it from your library so you don't have to pay for it, that would be probably ideal. Maybe if you don't read a huge amount of thrillers but you want to dip your toe in, you might find it a little bit more twisty. I also think it's probably better for people who are just interested in the mystery and solving it. In terms of my rating, again, this always can change as I have more time to let my thoughts percolate. But as it stands right now, I'm sitting at two stars. This is not the book for me. I feel very blah about it. I didn't particularly like it. It just exists. That is this book. And now I'm going to jump into the biggest boy that I have for this challenge, Ordinary Monsters. This one is how many pages? About 650 pages. So a little bit of a monster in and of itself, but I'm really hoping this one is a more positive reading experience. I feel like I've heard good things. And I'll be back soon to share my thoughts on Ordinary Monsters, and hopefully it's at least a three-star read. So I just hit the halfway point of Ordinary Monsters. I am on page 329. I'm really enjoying this so far. I right away was really taken by the writing style. I really enjoy the language. It's very descriptive, very atmospheric, very immersive. Um, definitely has a sort of creepy, eerie, gothic atmosphere. Everything is just a little dark and spooky and horrifying, and I really enjoy that. And this book definitely is more graphic in its sort of horror content than I expected. There's a lot of blood and gore. It's not over the top reveling in the grossness necessarily, but there is a lot of body horror and gore going on so far. But I'm really enjoying it. I find the magic system fascinating, sort of this world of people who have talents and all these different types of talents that they have and the strange and wonderful and sometimes horrible things they can do. I am really enjoying pretty much all of the characters. I found that I got attached to them very quickly, even characters that have only really been in the book for a short time. For example, there's a character near the beginning who you sort of think, and by the way that they're introduced, that they're going to be around for the whole book. And they leave, you know, a couple chapters in. And then at least to this point, that's it. I'm kind of hoping that they'll come back in the second half, but they were really only there in early chapters. And I still felt deeply attached to them. And I'm still sad that they're gone. So J.M. Miro is doing a fantastic job of really establishing strong characters 
very quickly after they're introduced. And as someone who really enjoys deep, complex, interesting characters, I'm a fan of that. This is, you know, a fantasy version of Dark Academia, and we have finally reached a school setting <laughs> after 300 plus pages. But this definitely has all of the vibes and the aesthetic of Dark Academia, and I'm really enjoying it. I mean, I'm a fan of fantasy in general. I'm a fan of sort of poetic, long-winded, atmospheric, detailed fantasy, and I would say that's what this is. I also enjoy, you know, darker themes and, you know, don't mind a little bit of horror. Some moments have definitely been a little shocking for me. I had a couple moments where I sort of had to reread a passage and then sit back and just process for a second because it was really gross. But yeah, really loving this, feeling very connected to the characters, very much invested in their journey and wanting everything to work out for them and wanting them to be safe and happy and loved and have a place to belong. So I'm having grand old time despite the length of this one and how heavy it is to hold <laughs> while I'm reading. The audiobook is also amazing. I've been trading off listening to the audiobook and reading the physical book and sometimes doing both at the same time. And the narrator is just knocking it out of the park fantastic narration. So I would highly recommend it. It's a long audiobook if you listen at one time speed. Luckily, I'm listening at about 2.8 <laughs> time speed, but fantastic narration. Really, really great. I think I'm going to keep this update pretty short just because at this point, I don't have a lot to say other than I'm really enjoying it <laughs> and all the things I already said. I don't think I really need a spoiler section as of yet. I'll probably do a spoiler section in my final update once I know how it ends, if I have, you know, extensive thoughts. That is it for this update, keeping it short and sweet. I'm going to keep reading and, you know, in another however many hours it takes me to read the second half of this, I will be back to give my final thoughts on Ordinary Monsters. So I just finished Ordinary Monsters and I really, really liked this. Dare I say, loved it. This was fantastic. I don't even know how much I have to say about it because I feel sort of like when you finish a book you really enjoy and you're just like, wow, that was great. No notes. Like, honestly, y'all know I am very picky. I can nitpick down to the tiniest little thing that I wish was different, even in a book that I really enjoyed. But there are some books that I just feel... I have very little to say. I don't really have any criticisms. I think honestly the only things that I could have wished for to be different in this would have been some of the characters who sort of disappeared from the story early on or ended up being killed at some point or another that I wish we'd had a little bit more time with or maybe we found them again. I do know that this is going to be a series. I don't know if it's just going to be a duology or if there are going to be more books than that. So maybe, you know, fingers crossed that some of those characters could show up in the next book. I would love that. Um, but that's not really a major criticism because I can understand how those characters leaving the story or dying were sort of part of the narrative and getting us to where we needed to be. If you are a fan of fantasy with a gothic setting, Victorian London and the sort of wilderness of that same time period Scotland and a little snippet of Tokyo at the same time. The vibes are immaculate. The writing was fantastic, as I mentioned in my first update. Really beautiful writing, very descriptive, very, I wouldn't say overly flowery, 
necessarily, I, I don't know that I would call it purple prose, but it's very descriptive, um, which is part of why the book is so long. <laughs> I think I saw a review somewhere when I was going on Goodreads to update my um, reading progress. And I just thought I had to quickly look at the first couple reviews that weren't marked as spoilers. And there was somebody complaining that every scene took 40 pages, that no one needed 40 pages to tell a scene. I, I feel like that's a bit of an exaggeration. But honestly, I thought the level of description was just right. It was enough to really set the scene, really make you feel like you're there, really draw you into the story with the sights and the sounds and the textures, all of those little things that really made the book sort of jump off the pages into my vivid imagination. Anyway, I think they added so much to the book and I would have been really sad to see all of those beautiful, comprehensive descriptions pulled out of the book to shorten it. It is a beast. It is very long. Okay, I acknowledge that, but I honestly don't necessarily think it needed to be shorter in my personal opinion. I think it was just right. <laughs> so I'm very happy and I don't have um, many thoughts because I just really loved it. I really cared about the characters. I was very invested in them. I am 100% going to read the next book as soon as I possibly can because I need to know what happened to one of the characters in particular who was probably my favorite and was in a bit of a precarious position at the end of the book. Just so good. I can't believe I've never heard of this author before and I'm wondering if this is their debut, in which case that is wild and impressive. But if they do have other books, I am off to read them because this was definitely my cup of tea. And even though arguably the two main characters were children, one a teenager and one an eight-year-old, this definitely didn't feel like a children's book. We do have sort of a crop of younger characters, but we also have several adult characters that we're following pretty closely and it felt very well balanced. That eight-year-old is the youngest character that we really spend any time with. Most of the younger characters are teenagers, but they have all been through a lot. And so while at times they have little flashes of, you know, teenage angst or rebelliousness or impulsivity because they're teenagers, they also have a certain level of maturity and sort of world wariness to them that made it a little bit easier to relate to them as an adult. But I also really enjoyed the adult characters and seeing what they were going through and their backstories. And I really liked that we did see quite a bit of the sort of extensive backstories for so many of the characters to see how they progressed through life to the point where we started the novel. So I'm kind of speechless. And I'm not rendered speechless often. So I feel like that is a great feat. Five stars for sure. I loved this. I definitely think this is a bit more of a tangential dark academia fit. From about halfway into the book to the end, it almost exclusively takes place in this sort of remote school type setting for people with these magical talents. But very little of it has to do with the actual study, although I did enjoy the little snippets we got of the actual studying. But it does, like I said in my first update, have a very heavily gothic atmosphere. It is very heavy on the vibes. <laughs> and that Victorian era, the dirty London streets, and the darkness, and the monsters, and the secrets, and the mysteries, and essentially magical powers, and also scientific experimentation is so good. I'm a big fan. Five stars. Very happy. I will put the book card up here on the screen with any of the trigger content warnings I noticed while reading. This book is significantly gorier and more violent than I had first expected. So just keep that in mind. I'm not going to do a spoiler section because I would literally just go through a list of all the characters and talk about why I liked each one because I liked literally every character, even the ones who were villains or just arguably awful human beings. You know, I didn't necessarily like them like I would want to be their buddy, but I thought that every character was really well drawn and complex and fascinating and very well developed. So that's it. Those are my thoughts for Ordinary Monsters. Took me a minute to read it. I feel like my wrists and arms are significantly stronger after holding this up over the last couple of days. I still continue to recommend the audiobook. The narrator did such a fantastic job. It was A+. Plus. So good. And now I'm going to go forth and read The Atlas Paradox, which is much shorter in comparison. It comes in at just under 400 pages. So this will be over before I know it. That's it. Off I go to read The Atlas Paradox.
hey, so I'm halfway through the Atlas Paradox and nothing's really happened yet. We just plot not a thing in the first 200 pages, which is fine. I don't always need a plot. You know, I'm a fan of plotless books, but the atmosphere isn't as strong as the first book, in my opinion, so far. Not a lot in terms of setting the scene and vibes. We have a tiny amount of philosophical or scientific debate, but it's very fractured and a bit chaotic in this book. I feel like I remembered the first book being a little bit more linear <laughs> in its discussions to the point where I could sort of follow them, whereas here I feel like characters randomly go into a monologue about some theory of you know science or philosophy and then they get cut off by another character and then it's not touched on again for a while and then another character goes on a completely unrelated tangent and it's just little fragments of interesting ideas that aren't being followed up on and I just feel a little bit like I'm a ping pong ball being bounced back and forth it's disorienting I must admit that I remembered not a lot of details from the first book. It's a while since I read it, and it took me a while to remember where we were starting off from and who these characters were and how I felt about them in the first book. I still, there are still a couple of characters that I can't honestly very clearly remember how I felt about them after the first book, so I'm sort of building new impressions of them as this book goes on. The characters are fine. I'm having a couple moments where I'm sort of chuckling at their banter back and forth. I'm enjoying Tristan and Nico's dynamic. Parisa and Atlas have a fun banter. Um, same thing with Callum and Reyna, but nothing to profound at this point. The characters are clearly just building off of the first book, and because it's been so long since I read it, they don't feel nearly as fleshed out as they did to me when I was reading the first book. I will say that Tristan as a character, I don't remember what my impressions were of him in the first book. He didn't stand out to me as much as many of the other characters, but in this book so far, I'm finding him by far the most interesting, and there's one specific rant that he goes on to Nico about his relationship with his father that was honestly, I don't even know how to describe it. It was amazing and heartbreaking and surprising and sort of out of left field, but also just pulled on my heartstrings and felt so raw and real and emotional and visceral in a way that I, I read it and I got sort of carried away and I had to stop and go back and start again and read it again with more care and attention. And then when I finished, I went back and highlighted and underlined parts of the passages. It was just amazing. And it made Tristan really jump to the top of my ranking of characters that I'm interested in following in this book. I do feel like I said, there's not a lot happening in the book so far. It's being pretty clearly telegraphed where this is going in terms of the plot, if we ever get to the plot. I'm not hating the experience of reading it by any means. It's very easy to read. I'm still interested in the world and the fate of these characters, even if I feel significantly more dispassionate about them now that I've had quite a bit of a break since reading the first book. But it's just not quite delivering the magic that I was hoping for, you know, and what I remembered from my experience of reading the first book, where I did not expect very much and then was kind of blown away by how much I enjoyed it and how intrigued I was by it, how engaged and immersed. I don't know if the second book is really capturing that, unfortunately. We'll see. Maybe the second half will be all the plot will come together and all of these sort of disparate threads of theories and debate and intellectual thought will sort of coalesce into something more coherent and I will be blown away by the mastery of the author pulling all these pieces together, but I don't know that my hopes are super high at this point. I'm just feeling a little bit disappointed. So I'm going to do a super short spoiler section. I just want to share my theory for what I think is going to happen, and then I'm going to finish this and do the final update. So my theory, I just want to say it out loud in case it comes true so I can feel smart, <laughs> but I feel like it's very obvious. So I don't know how smart I'll feel if it happens because I feel like it's obvious it's going to happen. But anyway, clearly Tristan has the ability to time travel 
or will develop the ability to time travel because he can manipulate time and is learning how to do so. And my theory is that he is going to, I'm trying to find the spot where I wrote it in the margin. My theory is that he's going to figure it out by continuing to practice with Nico. And then he's going to go back to 1980 nine or whatever year Libby is in, I already forgot, and bring her back so that Libby can be reunited with all of her friends who miss her so dearly. Yeah, so page 140 in the margin, I wrote, obviously he's going to figure it out and go back in time to save Libby. So that is my proof that I called it right there. So that's the only spoiler thing I have to share, really. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I am finding some of the little spats between characters pretty annoying especially Reyna and Nico and the fact that Reyna is just really mad at Nico for the way that he projected her in his initiation which I don't know it just seems like she's really reading into it and then everything he does no matter what it is pisses her off it's just kind of annoying to read it's like a preteen and everything that their little sibling does pisses them off and is the exact wrong thing for them to do. That's what it feels like their dynamic is. And it's just kind of not that interesting to me. And maybe again, it's because I'm less connected to the characters because it's been a while since I read the first book, but I just don't care about Raina's feelings being hurt in this circumstance. It's just a little boring. Those are my spoiler thoughts. And in general, those are my thoughts on the Atlas Paradox, the first half. Pretty slow so far. We'll see where it goes. Well, I'm going to go see where it goes because I'm going to go finish it. And then I'll tell you. So sit tight. It's almost one in the morning. I am tired and clearly mildly delirious. So I'm going to turn off all these bright lights and get ready for bed. And then probably read and stay up way too late and then be mad at myself in the morning when I'm extra exhausted because I stayed up till like 4 a.m. reading the story of my life. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay, so I have just finished The Atlas Paradox, which means I am finished the last book for this video. It feels like an achievement. Uh, the Atlas Paradox, it picked up a little bit in the second half. Interestingly enough, the one thing that I predicted that would happen didn't really happen, but the book also didn't really explain what happened or actively show us what happened, even though that was sort of the main problem to solve for the book. It was really the central conflict and it felt like a subplot for most of the book. And then it just resolved itself suddenly at the end without explaining how, other than some very vague throwaway lines, which is kind of disappointing. There's one coupling that got together near the end that I'm a big fan of, so I liked that, which I can share who those people are in the spoiler section. But otherwise, this book just didn't really do all that much for me, but also kind of in general. Not that much happened. We didn't get a huge amount of character development. A lot of those thought experiments, theories, intellectual debates that were intriguing that I mentioned in the first update were sort of piecemeal, chopped up, random pieces here and there um, that weren't particularly well developed or cohesive, never really came together in the end. It did feel like this book had sort of second book syndrome where it's a bit of filler, it's a bit of building things up, developing things for the next installment. It just didn't 
go anywhere. And I'm not huge on reading series. I will, you know, read them semi-regularly, but I definitely prefer standalones. And part of the reason for that is that when I read a series, I still want each installment to have its own beginning, middle, and end, and conflict and resolution, sort of follow the structure of a story, have its own value as a piece of literature, as a story outside of the series as a whole. Obviously, some books can't really exist outside of a series, and you need to know what happened before to understand what's happening in the book. And that's fine, but I want the book itself to still feel like it was worth reading and not just something that I have to get through so that I can be on the same page as the author when the next book starts. That just feels like a waste of my time. And that's kind of what this felt like, a waste of my time, which is unfortunate. It wasn't horrific. The writing wasn't terrible. I didn't hate my time reading it. It was fine. I just was waiting for something to happen and nothing ever did. And that's just kind of all I can say, which is sad. So yeah, that's the Atlas Paradox. Spoilers here for the Atlas Paradox. The fact that Libby got back to their regular timeline without us covering it at all or seeing it happen or watching how she figured out not only creating the explosion she needed to create because it was built up that she couldn't do it on her own without Nico's help at the very least, if not also Reyna's help, but the fact that she was able to direct herself through time to the exact right moment. Like, how did she do that? That seemed like something we were going to need Tristan's time powers for. Zero explanation. She just shows up in the second last chapter or the last chapter, I guess, and then in the epilogue. And I think she says like four words <laughs> and that's it. Oh, and murders Ezra does that too. But yeah, just very little in the way of actually getting to see the resolution to the problem of the entire book, which was a disappointment. And maybe that will be explained in book three, but I just find it kind of annoying to force me to read a whole other book just to find out how that worked when that was what three of the main characters were working towards for this entire book. I did love that Nico and Gideon had a kiss in the epilogue and potentially are going to be together. I think they are perfect for each other. I ship them hard. I think Gideon is fantastic. I like Nico a lot too. I love the idea of them and Max just being a cute little family <laughs> and I'm on board. I, I love that. I still feel like so much of what was going on is so vague still. Like Ezra is convinced that Atlas is going to try to ruin the world or has a god complex, which reminds me that there were so many through lines of various characters having god complexes through this book, but none of them really went anywhere or were resolved in any way or escalated in any interesting way. I was kind of hoping Reyna with her god complex that she was going to go off the deep end and become this maniacal plant controlling life giving force in the world and I thought that would be entertaining and interesting but to no avail. Parisa felt like a bit of a afterthought in this book which was kind of too bad. I found her character really interesting in the first book. She just sort of popped up from time to time to be seductive and I feel like her little subplot with Dalton was just trying to set up their arc in the third book. Again, just kind of annoying for me to read a very slow build of their relationship where up until the very end, very little changed for them and their dynamic. Oh yeah, I did enjoy the reveal that Belen, who Libby has a friendship turned romance with in 1989, turns out to be the professor in the current timeline who has like gone mad professor evil science villain because she was so hurt by Libby's choice to cause harm to a bunch of random bystanders for her own selfish needs on top of all of the, you know, tragedy and horror she'd already experienced in her life and all of the injustices in the world and knowing that in the future none of the things that she was hoping magic would be able to resolve were being resolved because no one gave a shit because capitalism and power are more important to the people who have power and resources. Yeah, I kind of liked that reveal. I didn't see it coming, but it's too bad that it seems like she died, either was murdered or like imploded. I would have loved to see her and Libby's reckoning, although maybe she didn't actually die. I found that portion kind of vague, so who knows what happened. I found Libby sort of suddenly becoming evil a little strange. I could understand her kind of working her way around the ethical quandaries to allow herself to take the action she needed to take to get back to her own timeline for selfish reasons. I mean, even good people tend to be selfish. I think it's sort of built into our DNA, into the human species, that we have a self-preservation instinct and we are all selfish creatures to a certain extent. So 
I would have found it interesting if there was a little bit more nuance in that and more guilt and if she was conflicted about it. But it felt like she went from saying, oh my God, no, I could never do such a thing. That's impossible. That's horrific. How could I? And then two seconds later, she was like, actually, fuck it. I'm powerful. What's the point of existing if I don't use my power? And I want to go back. So I'm going to do it no matter what the consequences are. It's already happened. I don't give a shit. Which was just less interesting to me than experiencing her going through that back and forth and the pros and cons and wrestling with herself and her conscience. It's a little boring for her to just decide that now she's power hungry and selfish and doesn't give a shit. Maybe it'll be interesting how that develops in the third book. I don't know, but it just kind of felt like the least interesting way to get her character to that place. I also was intrigued by this, the archives are sentient conversation, but again, it sort of felt like it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, just kind of lots of threads, lots of disparate ideas that just sort of didn't turn into anything. As for rating, I'm kind of on the fence. I'm, I'm sitting at about a two and a half stars, rounded up to three. Here's the book card, the trigger content mornings I noticed. That brings us to the end of this video. So let me grab the other books so I can hold them all, even though they're heavy. So ranking these four books, I would say The Maidens and The Atlas Paradox are sort of tied in their mediocrity for me. And then we move quite a bit up in their ranking to These Violent Delights, which is a four-star read, very close to a five-star read. And then we get Ordinary Monsters, which I gave five stars and I really loved. I would love to hear your ratings, reviews, thoughts on any of these books that you've read. I'd also love to know if you're thinking of picking up one of these books now that you've seen this video, or alternatively, if you've taken one of them off your TBR, leave those in the comments down below. This is getting very heavy, so I'm going to get going. I hope you enjoyed this Dark Academia reading vlog, a follow-up to the one I made last year. I will link that one so you can watch it if you missed it for more Dark Academia reads. But I had a lot of fun with this and found a couple new favorites, which is always fun. Thank you again to Marlo for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get an extra 10% off your Marlo purchase. That's on top of their already awesome buy more, save more deal, where if you buy two pillows, you get 20% off. And if you buy four pillows, you get 30% off. My husband and I are loving our Marlo pillows and I know you will too. And with that, I'm going to get going. Thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you really soon in my next one. Bye friends.